Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson at Excel International GCSE Chemistry Paper 2C for June 2022. This is the Part 2 video. I will put the link to the Part 1 video below the description box. Let's begin with the first question, question 5. It says, an organic compound has this percentage composition by mass. Carbon is 40%, hydrogen is 6.7%, oxygen is 53.3%. They want us to show that the empirical formula of the compound is CH2O. So I began by positioning the atoms, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And below them, I put a percentage by mass. Here we have 40, 6.7, and 53.3. And then the next step is to find the number of moles. We can find the number of moles by when we divide the percentage composition by mass. Divide that by the atomic mass for each atom. So for carbon, it's going to be 12. For hydrogen, it's 1. And for oxygen is 16. And these are the corresponding number of moles after the division. After that, we have to find the mole ratio. We find the mole ratio by dividing through the other moles by the smallest number of moles. So 3.33 is the smallest. When you divide 3.33 by 3.33, you get 1. 6.7 divided by 3.33, you get a 2. And 3.33 divided by 3.33, you get a 1. So this means that we have one carbon two hydrogens and one oxygen in the empirical formula. Therefore, it's in agreement with what we have here in the question, which is CH2O. That should be the answer. Next, they say, draw the structure formula of a compound with the molecular formula that. Now, in this question, they have not specified if this organic compound is a carboxylic acid or an ester. Now, for most students, your mind is going to rush to a carboxylic acid. So I drew the carboxylic acid. If we have two carbons, and uh, we have four hydrogens as well as one, uh, two oxygens. This is a good example. A carboxylic acid could be, uh, like here we have ethanoic acid. However, there is another potential ester somebody could have thought about. If I drew an ester like that, O, oh, and then CH3 here. If you observe this, we have four hydrogens, we have two carbons, and then we have two oxygens. This is methyl methanoate, as you can see that that is also an ester. So there is a possibility of this, as well as a possibility of a carboxylic acid. So let's move on. Here they say, aha, methanoic acid, which is the one we have seen behind there. So this is a possibility of a methanoic acid. They say methanoic acid reacts with sodium carbonate solution to give three products. Uh, this is an acid, and this is a metal carbonate. When a metal carbonate uh, reacts with an acid, we expect to get salt, carbon dioxide, and water. I think you can see here, I said when this acid reacts with a metal carbonate, we will get a salt, we'll get carbon dioxide, and we'll get water. It doesn't matter if this acid is an organic acid or it's an inorganic acid, you will get a salt, carbon dioxide, and water. So they wanted us to finish this equation. The salt that is going to be got is sodium methanoate, as you can see here, and then the CO2 and the H2O. You have to multiply by 2 here because we have twice the amount of methanoic acid given here uh, to balance the equation. So this should be the equation, the one you see in blue. Uh, down here they say, state what you would observe in this reaction. When this reaction goes on, you can see a gas is going to be produced, which is carbon dioxide gas. So the observation should be bubbles of a gas, or you could say effervescence occurs. Next, methanoic acid also reacts with propanol to form an ester. So they say... This equation, uh, the, the equation for the reaction is as below. So this is another possible ester. Here we can see methanoic acid reacting with uh, propanol, which is an alcohol, to give us this ester. And then we can see here water. This is an esterification reaction. So they asked you to give the name of the ester that forms. This ester here, if you want to be able to name the ester, the other part should be the alkyl part. In this case, there are three carbons, so it's going to be propyl. And this part has one carbon, so it's going to be something with meth. And since it is coming from a carboxylic acid, so we call it the methanoate. So this is going to be propyl methanoate. Methan propyl methanoate, the propyl coming from this part, and then one carbon giving it the methanoate. So that is the ester. Next, they say, state what is made by the, this double arrow reaction. It means that the reaction is reversible. So this reaction can go forward as well as backwards. Next, they say, when this reaction occurs in a sealed container, a reaction can reach dynamic equilibrium. Give one characteristic of a reaction at dynamic equilibrium. 
Now, when we observe this, when a reaction is at dynamic equilibrium during that state of dynamic equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction should be exactly equal to the rate of the backward reaction. And again, during that time, the concentration of the reactants and the products do not change. Please note that the concentration of the reactant and the product are not necessarily equal, but they remain unchanged during dynamic equilibrium. So here I wrote the forward rate and the backward rate are equal, and the concentration of the reactants and the products do not change during that time. So we can continue. Here they say a polyester forms when butane dioic acid reacts with ethane diol. This is a diol and this is a dicarboxylic acid. So they say the diagram shows the repeat unit of the polyester that forms. This is a repeat unit. They want you to give the name of this type of polymerization. This is condensation polymerization because we can see uh, a, a dicarboxylic acid and diol or a dialcohol or diol have combined. A water molecule has been lost, so that is a condensation reaction. Therefore, since you polymerize through condensation, we call it condensation polymerization. Next, they ask, draw the structure formally of the two monomers used to make the polyester. Uh, the carboxylic acid during esterification, the carboxylic acid loses OH, so we would expect there was an OH here, there was an OH here, and for the alcohol, there was an H here, and there was an H that side. So when you draw those two, we get this part here and that part. This making this one here and that other part making the part from the alcohol. Question six, titanium is an important metal in industry. Titanium dioxide, which we have that, can be converted into titanium metal in two stages. In stage one, the titanium dioxide is converted into titanium IV chloride, which we have that, titanium four chloride. And in stage two, the titanium four chloride is converted into titanium. So they say this is the equation for the reaction in stage one. That is for that, re that, uh, that reaction. This is the equation. Then they say calculate the volume in decimeters cubed of chlorine gas at room temperature and pressure needed to react completely with 20 tons of titanium dioxide. We want to find the volume of this needed to react with 20 tons of this. So I began by converting this mass in grams because if you want to use any mass in calculations, it has to be grams. So I say the mass of titanium for oxide, titanium, uh, this one, the, the titanium oxide we have here is going to be that, 20 tons. And in this case, it's going to be 20 times 10 power 6 because tons is the same as uh, you multiply by 10 power 6 to convert it to grams. So moving on here. I want to ensure everything is okay. So moving down here, they say the moles of that. To calculate the moles of this, since I have the mass and I know the molar mass that this is that titanium oxide, I just divide it by the molar mass to be able to find here what is the number of moles. And since when I find the number of moles of this, I'm going to use the equation or I'll use the mole ratio to be able to find the number of moles of chlorine. And as we can see, the mole ratio is 1 to 2. It means the moles of chlorine are going to be 2 times the moles of the oxide of titanium. So this is going to be 2 times 2.5 times 10 power 5, which gives us a 5.0 times 10 power 5 as the moles of chlorine gas that is going to be required. Now, the question asked us to calculate the volume in decimeters cubed. If I have the, here, if I have the number of moles, I can use the molar gas equation, which is number of moles should be the volume of the gas divided by the molar gas volume. So here, if I want to make the volume of the gas the subject, it should be number of moles times the molar gas volume. This molar gas volume is 24 decimeters cubed per mole. And the number of moles, I have them to be 5.0 times 10 power 5 moles. So I can just substitute, as you see here, and my answer was 1.2 times 10 power 7 decimeters cubed. So let me continue. The next part says in stage two, titanium four chloride vapor is passed through molten magnesium in a container filled with argon. This is the equation for the reaction in stage two. So we can see this equation as well. They say explain why the container is filled with argon rather than air. Remember the container contains some magnesium and this magnesium is molten. If it contained air, the air oxygen in the air would have reacted with the magnesium to form an oxide of magnesium and therefore the required reaction wouldn't have taken place properly. So using argon, which is inert or unreactive, will prevent the reaction with magnesium and therefore magnesium will be available to react with the titanium for chloride. So I said argon is inert, meaning unreactive. So it will not react with magnesium. 
And if the container is filled with no more air, the oxygen in the air would oxidize the magnesium. Next, they say, aeroplanes are made of an alloy containing aluminium and titanium. Explain why the alloy is stronger than pure titanium metal. When we talk about strength, it means it has the ability to withstand a force. If a force is applied onto it, it's not going to be easily this, um, changed. Or the shape is not going to be easily changed. So they want you to include diagrams. You may include diagrams if you want. I tried to put a diagram for you here to kind of show the description. I said uh, if this is the pure metal, when a force is applied, because the atoms are arranged in layers, it's easy for these layers to slide past each other. And again, you are free to say atoms or ions. You talk about ions because there is metallic bonding, but also atoms is allowed. So atoms are arranged in layers when a force is applied. They slide past each other, causing the malleability or the ability of these to be reshaped. However, in an alloyed version, as you can see here, when a force is applied, due to the different uh, sizes of the atoms that are present, the shape is not going to be easily changed. The layers will not easily slide past each other, and therefore, it's going to have greater strength. So I said, pure titanium will contain atoms of the same size. These are arranged in layers, and the layers of atoms can easily slide past each other, making it softer. The alloy contains atoms of different sizes, and when a force is applied, the layers do not easily slide past each other. This makes the alloy stronger. So this brings us to the end of question 6. I will continue to question 7. Question 7. A student uses this apparatus to find the heat energy supplied by a liquid fuel. So this is the setup. We can see there is a copper container. There is some water inside. There is a thermometer to ensure that the heat is evenly distributed throughout the water. And there, as well as uh, measuring the temperature of the water. Here we have a, a spirit burner that has, or a fuel burner that has a liquid fuel. So heat is going to be generated here and it's going to be transferred to the water inside the copper container. So the question says, the student burns some fuel to heat the water in the copper container and measures the temperature change or change in temperature. The student notices that the bottom of the container turns black. Give the name of the black substance that forms at the bottom of the container. If it turns black, it's because there is incomplete combustion and that black product should be carbon that is formed at the, at the bottom of that container. Moving on, they say, in one experiment, the student burns 0.92 grams of ethanol. So this is the mass of the fuel that is burnt to produce heat. The student calculates that the heat energy absorbed by the water is 18.2 kilojoules. Show that the, uh, the results of this experiment give an approximate value for the enthalpy of combustion of ethanol of a delta H is equal to negative 900 kilojoules per mole. One thing you need to know is enthalpy change of combustion is always exothermic. So also we know that this formula here for an exothermic delta H, delta H should equal to negative Q over N, where Q is the amount of heat that is going to be absorbed. Like in this case, it's 18.2. Now, the N here is corresponding to the um, number of moles of the fuel that is burnt. So in order to do that, I calculated the number of moles of ethanol since I knew the fuel was ethanol. So number of moles should be the mass of ethanol divided by the MR of ethanol, which is 46, and I got 0 0.02 moles. So when I substituted those moles into here, I divided and I got negative 910 kilojoules per mole. This is the enthalpy change that I have calculated and we can see it's closer to negative 900 kilojoules per mole, so that should be a correct approximation. Moving on. Here they say, the data book value of delta H for compression of ethanol is negative 1367 kilojoules per mole. Give two reasons why the student's value is much lower than the data book value. It means, this, this question here is asking you that why is the student's calculated value of delta H lower in magnitude than that of uh, the data book value. So the reason is maybe some heat was lost to the surrounding as the heat was leaving the spirit burner. It did not completely, it did not completely get transport, transferred or transferred to the uh, copper can that contained the water. Therefore, there was heat loss to the surrounding. It could be due to incomplete combustion. Remember, if there is insufficient oxygen supply, the fuel will not completely burn. And actually, the question even talked about a black substance being formed at the bottom of the copper container that shows there is a possibility of incomplete combustion of ethanol 
And lastly, there could be evaporation of ethanol. As the spirit burner is open in order to be lit, some of the ethanol could evaporate. Since ethanol is uh, highly volatile, it could evaporate. So these are the three reasons why. And again, remember the data booklet value is the accurate value. So if you're comparing this, it means the value would have been this if the conditions were perfect. But since the conditions were not perfect, this is the value we calculated due to this. So the value is negative 910 instead of negative 1367 due to some energy being lost in the process. So here they say the question, uh, the equation shows the com uh, combustion of methane. Here we can see methane is burnt in oxygen producing carbon dioxide and water. And the enthalpy change for that is negative 890 kilojoules per mole. Then they say, this is the question showing the displayed formula. So we can see the formula displayed. We are going to use the data in this table in order to be able to calculate the enthalpy change using the bond enthalpies. So let's continue on. The next part says calculate the bond energy of the carbon-hydrogen bond using information from the equation and the table. So we know from the, maybe from your notes, you should know that uh, to calculate the enthalpy change, it should be using the bond enthalpies. It should be the summation of the bonds broken minus the summation of the bonds formed. So I am going to take you back to the table so that we can see, and then we come back and show how we calculate this. So let's go back. Here we have, if you look at this equation here, we have four carbon hydrogen bonds, one, two, three, four. And then we have two oxygen, oxygen double bonds, one and two. These are at the reactant side, so we're going to add up their bond enthalpy, and then that will be the sum of the bonds that are broken. And then on the other side, we have two carbon-oxygen double bonds, and then we have four oxygen-hydrogen bonds. So we will sum up this, and that will be the total of the bonds that are formed. We are going to use this table of enthalpy changes or bond enthalpies in order to be able to calculate that. So I'll go back to the next page. Here... The first thing I did is to find the sum of the bonds that are broken. We know we have four carbon hydrogens and two oxygen oxygen. I fed into their enthalpy changes or the bond enthalpy values that were given. And for this, I found 99.996. And here, remember, our question is to look for the bond enthalpy for the carbon hydrogen bond. So to go to the bonds that are formed, we had two carbon oxygen double bonds and four oxygen hydrogen bonds. So each, each of these is 805 times 2. And then each of these is 463. When I added up everything, I got 3462. I have this. I have that. I have the enthalpy change. I will feed everything into this formula to be able to calculate the bond enthalpy for the carbon-hydrogen bond. So from the previous page, we know that this is the enthalpy change that is given. So I substituted that, which is that, minus that, which is that. And when I simplified, I got that the carbon-hydrogen bond should be 394 kilojoules per mole. That is the bond enthalpy for the carbon-hydrogen bonds. And uh, moving down here, they say, complete the energy level diagram to show the products and the delta H. So remember, they have given you this, uh, they, they drew for you some part, they showed you the energy, and they wrote the reactants. It means I had to draw, uh, to draw a level for the products and then put the enthalpy change. From our equation, from our question, we know that this has been an exothermic reaction, so the product should be at a lower energy than the reactant. So you draw the product lower and then position a vertical line. You're free to put an arrow on that, but you position a vertical line to show that uh, this is the gap between the products and the reactant, and that should be the enthalpy change for this specific reaction. So I put delta H, or you could write negative 890 kilojoules per mole, and then this side, you write the products, they have to be in a balanced equation as well. So this brings us to the end of question seven, as well as the end to this paper two. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.